Uh, uh, this morning we've talked about uh, international issues and national issues as, it, as they relate uh, in Japan. And I'm going to really sort of change the uh, emphasis here and come down to a very, very local level. And I'm going to take you back to places I know well. Uh, I'm going to take you to the county of Northumberland in the far north of England and talk to you about two projects that I've been involved in. Uh, they're two quite different projects, but both of them at their heart have got intangible cultural heritage. I'm going to talk to you about the Flodden Eco Museum, which uh, is the first eco museum to be created in England. And in fact, it's actually a cross border eco museum because it uh, lies really between England and, and Scotland. So it's a, the first cross border eco museum as well. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that and, and why it's important in a moment. Um, and the second one is a place called Lindisfarne or Holy Island, which is an island off the coast of, of Northumberland. They are very different projects, but as I say, they both have ICH at their heart. And in Flodden, it's really the memory of a battle which took place 500 years ago between the English and the Scots and the memories of that battle which lie at the heart of the Eco Museum. In Holy Island, it's, it's the religious dimension because Holy Island is one of the most important religious sites in England. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we, uh, as we go through the presentation. Just to put things into geographical context for you, um, this is the area that we're talking about between England and Scotland. And I'm, I haven't got a, a pointer here. I don't know how I can explain this easily. I'll try pointing at the screen perhaps. I don't think this will, will this work. Yes, this will work. Okay. So this yellow part of the map of England is Northumberland. So this is the um, county of, of Northumberland, of, of England, where I live and work. And you can see that the, as we move one step up here, we move into Scotland. So we're right on the boundary between those two countries. And here you've got a, a, a bigger map, a blown up map of that area. Here you can see Scotland on one side and here England. And this area is known as the border country. And it is certainly in the past, it was fought over for centuries between the English and the Scots. We were always fighting, okay? And that is sort of one of the reasons why this area is particularly interesting. Because this area really is, is quite remote, they are trying to think about how they can increase um, or enable development and use heritage resources to enable development. Uh, and this is particularly the, the case really in Flodden. Well, what they're trying to do through the implementation of eco-museum principles is try to encourage more people to visit the area. So there is an economic dimension really to the development of the Flodden Eco Museum. Um, on Holy Island, it's really a matter, they do get quite a lot of people who come to visit. It's, uh, it's a very popular place, place with uh, local tourists. Uh, and what they're doing here really is through this particular partnership is to try to think about how they manage their heritage assets better. Okay, so two quite different projects, probably with different uh, aims and objectives, but both again having uh, important intangible dimensions. So let's have a look at Flodden Eco Museum to begin with. Uh, the Battle of Floddenfield took place on the 9th of September, 1513. 
so almost 500 years ago. Um, the memory of the battle, however, is still very, very strong. Uh, surprisingly strong, and particularly so on the Scottish side of the border, um, where people still reflect on what happened on that one day in history. You can see that 1513 is, there will be 500 years next year, so a group of people came together to think about how do we commemorate this battle? How do we actually memorialize it? And how do we interpret it? And how can we perhaps use this to think about interpreting not just the site of the battle itself, but all the associated sites around about and the intangible cultural heritage which is associated with the battle. Now, battlefields like this are, are very strange and this one, in fact, is, of course, in private ownership. It isn't owned by the state, it's owned by, in fact, a local lord. And the reason I got involved is that um, he came um, to my department in the university and said, look, we're trying to think about projects, to think about the heritage of this, of this battle and how we might take these ideas forward. I said, well, why don't you have one of our students on placement for a while? So we sent a student to work with him um, and in fact, he'd been listening to my lectures, innumerable lectures on eco-museums and community museology. And he actually enthused this landowner to think about community involvement and thinking about, think about perhaps using eco-museum principles uh, to interpret the battle. So that's really how I became involved because my student there did a very good job for him. They took all these ideas on board, uh, and since then I've been involved in it by going along to community meetings over a period of about two years. Um, and I think I've been to about 12 meetings altogether, but uh, the team who've been putting this eco-museum idea together have had something like 50 meetings with various members of different local communities throughout this border region to think about how this eco-museum could be set up. So it's been a very, very inclusive process. Let me tell you a little bit more about the battle and you can see why it was so important. Uh, it's very difficult to us, for us to imagine what a medieval battle must have been like, but it must have been fairly horrendous. This battle took place because it happened during the time of Henry VIII, and Henry VIII was constantly at war with France. He didn't like the French very much at all. But the Scots were good allies with the French, and the French and the Scots came together and they decided to form an alliance and to attack England. So the Scots under the Scottish King James IV decided to move into England and uh, take over, really, the north of England. The French were going to invade from the sea uh, and, if you like, essentially uh, defeat England and take, take it over. Um, when Henry heard about the Scots coming into the far north of England, he sent his troops north and they met at Flodden Field in September 1513. And it was a dreadful battle. And in fact, the Scots were very, very badly defeated. Um, in, within the space of about four hours, 14,000 men were killed. So it's equivalent, if you like, to some of the worst battles which took place during the First World War. Um, so a savage battle, and worst of all for the Scots, their king was killed, most of their nobility was killed, uh, a large part of their um, forces were captured. So it, it, it was an, an annihilation, really, of the, of, the, of the Scots. And for that reason, of course, it sticks in the memory, really, uh, as being a very, very significant battle. 
uh, a complete rout for the Scottish people. And that had all sorts of implications, as we'll see. So this memory, if you like, of this event that took place is, is still there. And if you go to Flodden, it's, well, this is it. This is a view of Flodden Field, okay? This is what it looks like on site. And it's hard really to sort of imagine that, you know, what happened there on that day. And I think this little quote, which is actually comes from uh, one of the generals who took part in the American Civil War. And I quite like this little quote. Uh, and I'll just read it to you. On great fields, something stays. Forms change and pass. Bodies disappear, but spirits linger to consecrate bound ground for the vision place of souls. Generations that know us not shall come to this deathless field to ponder and dream. And lo, the shadow of the mighty presence shall wrap them in its bosom and the power of the vision pass into their souls. So there's something, if you like, about these places that is important to us. You know, it's the intangible nature of this place which is, which is actually important. And that leads us really into this idea of place because I think there's a really important connection between intangible cultural heritage and place. It's very difficult, I think, to separate the two. And I've always been introduced, interested in this idea of sense of place. And it goes, as Tuan said, beyond aesthetic appreciation. In other words, places are not always comfortable or welcoming. And certainly when you go to a battlefield, they're not comfortable places. They're not comfortable things really to contemplate. And also that place is something that must be experienced rather than described. So being there is actually important. That it provides meaning for us, or a world of meaning, uh, according to some experts. So this idea of ICH and place come together, really, I think, within the idea of, of the eco-museum. And that's why the, when um, the people who were thinking about this 500-year commemoration, uh, I think they latched onto the eco-museum ideal for very, very good reasons. You can see there's little bits of interpretation that had already begun to happen at, at Flodden uh, itself, little interpretive panels and a commemorative stone here to mark the site of the battle. But other than that, up until recently, there was actually very little there to tell you about this event that had taken place. Um, and there had all already been some ideas about interpretation. I think, I like this, this is an old telephone box, okay? For those of you who have been to England, you will recognize our red telephone boxes. With the advent of mobile phones, most of them aren't used anymore, so they, they, they get recycled, and this one has become a little interpretive center. So here, a little guide to the battle in the village of Brankston, which is the closest little village to, to where the battle actually took place. So... Eco-museums then recognize this special nature of place. There's something happening at Flodden already, but um, you know, there is this very special nature of place that eco-museums represent. Um, and you remember from my talks, which you had to sit through uh, when, you, when you came on our meetings previously, they must be planned and managed in cooperation with local communities. And we see them really as a more democratic vision for cultural and natural heritage. So I think at Flodden we've got this idea of the intangible and place, distinctiveness, community coming together. And you might remember this little diagram that I showed you on the uh, previous uh, courses. And you can see that right at the, at the heart of it here we've got collective memory. This idea of, of memory being very, very significant to eco-museum ideas. So collective memory, landscapes, 
traditions, sites, all those things sort of fitting together into this territory. So when the, um, the people, uh, the management team, if you like, who were trying to set up this Eco Museum, they were trying to think, well, what is the territory? What, what do we set off, really, as the territory for this, for this battle? And what they wanted to do really, really was to indicate how the battle had come about, um, how the troops had moved from one place to another, what the aftermath was. And so there are a number of different sites that they, working with local people, were selected to be part of the Eco Museum itself. And going back again, trying to remember about our Eco Museum characteristics a territory, so looking at a particular uh, place, not necessarily defined by conventional boundaries. So here we're talking about a battlefield, but maybe the bigger, wider geographical dimensions of, uh, that happened before the battle. A fragmented site policy, intangible heritage being significant, community empowerment, a holistic vision, local identity and sense of place. And I think all those things come together really nicely within the Flodden Eco Museum. So, as I mentioned, they, it's been a long process. This has taken about three years to actually go from conceptualizing the Flodden Eco Museum to actually delivering it. And it's taken a lot of man hours, a lot of community meetings, which have taken place throughout all the villages and towns in the Borders region, which have a connection with the battle. And there are a number of different sites which the communities themselves selected. First of all, the Flodden Monument itself at Brankston, which is the little village where the, the site nearest to the site of the battle. There's a corn mill, Heatherslaw Corn Mill, which was actually in operation 500 years ago and is still there, and in fact has been rebuilt and is in itself a, a, a heritage attract, attraction. You've got Brankston Church, where the body of the King of Scotland was taken after the battle, before being carried off in triumph down to London afterwards. And a lot of the people, the uh, people who were killed in the battle or the injured, were actually brought to this church and were treated there or buried there. And there's this little plaque in the churchyard, and you won't be able to read it, uh, but it says, The body of King James IV of Scotland lay here in the chancel of the church overnight before being carried to Berwick and thence to London on the order of King Henry VIII of England. Okay, so his body is carried away. Other important tangible sites, Twizel Bridge, which was the route the English army took uh, on their way north. They went over the, one of the rivers here. Selkirk is a town in the Scottish borders on the Scottish side of the border. Uh, and Selkirk sent several hundred archers to the Battle of Flodden. Only one came back, and he was called Fletcher. And this monument was created to him and stands in front of the town hall in Selkirk. So that became another of the eco-museum sites, another place to visit. Eatle Castle is in England and was taken by the Scots um, as part of the battle. They took that first, and then they uh, moved further south. Still there, an important site of memory. And in fact, even places in Edinburgh have, have become part of the Eco Museum. After the battle, the aftermath of the battle was so great that the Scots were really concerned that the English army was going to move north and take Edinburgh, to take the capital of Scotland. So they very quickly built a defensive wall around the city, and parts of that still remain. Very few people know it's there, and those people who see it probably don't even know why it's there. 
but again, it's commemorating, it's, it's a, a way of memorializing this event that took place 500 years ago.